Gentlemen, please. Lord Fisher, Admiral Snelson, sir, gentlemen. My name is Commander Stuart Barrons, responsible for the arrangements for this evening and also to receive many of your phone calls over the last month. Um, it's been a pleasure to arrange these events and I hope for the, the people that are staying in the wardroom overnight tonight you found your accommodation um, satisfactory. You, you're actually occupying a cabin that's normally Monday to Friday occupied by um, a service personnel um, and they've graciously given you the cabin uh, for, the, for the night tonight. Um, this afternoon, for your dog watch instruction, we've got a Mr. Tony Lovell, um, who's come over from America. Um, you may, some of you may recall a presentation he gave at the Fisher Conference at Shrivenham last year. And actually, Tony's been working on a video presentation um, since August of 2000, and he's been tweaking it since the Fisher presentation of last year. He's travelled at his own expense to come and present to you, an uh, esteemed audience, and people with many, many years of gunnery. And I'm sure that he would wish to pick your brains as much as you would ask him questions. <laughs> Tony is a graduate of Princeton uh, in engineering, uh, electrical engineering and also computer science. Um, he admits to really care about the things he cares about and really not bothered about the rest of the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but he aims, he aims to share and, and also to amplify areas of history that you feel are, are not fully explained and, and he's working, has been working extensively in the dreadnought area. His primary goal, he states, is to create a multiplayer simulator. He loves technology, he loves the ships and also, in his words, the majestic proportion of the dreadnought era. So, over to you, Tony. Thank you. Well, this is, Stuart described this as an esteemed audience, and uh, to me, it's one that probably couldn't be surpassed. Uh, and there are some boilers burning very hot to uh, supply all that esteem. So I, I let me. I'm going to put up just one or two slides, but slides are not going to characterize this presentation. I'm going to be spending much of my time hopping around in front of you. <laughs> I'm Anthony, but Tony is what I'm more often known as, and even Tone, particularly in email. Uh, 41 years old, uh, I am an engineer, I have no history of naval service, uh, although far after I got involved in this study, I realized, you know, my father was a gunnery officer. He was the gunnery officer of uh, USS Hainsworth. Uh, destroyer during the Korean War, although uh, there was no action uh, during the time he was on the ship. I'm fond of games and military history, and much of what I'll show you will look a little bit like what a modern-day computer game looks like. It's not quite as visually stunning, but this is the way that I've tried to demonstrate the things which I've siphoned from manuals from your National Archives, or on this visit, uh, a visit to the Admiralty Library. So, uh, just to, to cast a quick overview on what we're doing, I'm going to show a four-minute film of, about aiming and firing torpedoes, as it might have been done around 1908 and by some ships during the Great War. Uh, then we're on to the, the main course, which will be uh, dizzying. Uh, and I hope to hear from many of you on the particulars of what was shown, what was right, and what was wrong. Improving the work is, is something that you're well positioned to help me do. And then uh, discussion of future directions I might take my work and, and uh, any questions. And certainly I'd, I'd, wanna, I'd wanna exchange contact information with any of you who would find that uh, fruitful. So, let's start with the destroyer a torpedo attack simulation. <laughs> I started uh, my study of ships by doing high-definition 3D modeling on a computer uh, using plans from uh, the National Maritime's uh, plan annex. Started with the destroyer, HMS Akron, if I'm saying that correctly. 
let me shut down the PowerPoint. Uh, one, one moment, please. Make sure we're getting our best performance here. But as I got in closer looking at things, I'd see puzzling things like a table for a torpedo director. And there was nothing to tell me just what that was. And I was fascinated to the point that I eventually found a manual in the National Archives of, uh, of the torpedo director, sufficient text to describe its function, and I could model it in high fidelity. Really pegged that. But this is sort of like taking a butterfly and putting a pin through it. It's still flat. It's still not very lively. If we make a game of it, however, we can, we can demonstrate through use the principles that underlie its design. So here we are in the simulation. We're on a destroyer, and we have an unwilling uh, volunteer in this, a German battleship off our starboard side. Uh, torpedoes were often as simple as riding astride them behind the torpedo director, which I lost a little visual veracity, but it's now interactive. I'll start by cranking uh, the torpedo tube so it's right out of the beam. Uh, like many of the instruments, this one's a very straightforward analog. It, it's, we're reproducing in a miniature, reconfigurable brass fashion uh, the, the triangle of, of the torpedo solution. We orient a bar to the, to the crossing angle of the target. We slide a truck against a scale of knots to our estimate of his speed. Another slider, we input the torpedo speed. It will run at 35 knots. And now, when we crouch down and look along the length of the sighting bar, a hypotenuse of our, of our torpedo triangle, uh, we'd, we'd see the target at the appropriate time to fire the torpedo, provided that our inclination is correct and that we've estimated his speed correctly. But we're not going to wait. We were well behind him and slowly overtaking him with our crosshairs. We, we, we swung our torpedo 15 degrees ahead of him, and now we have to change his crossing angle because that will alter. We swing that arm 15 degrees the other direction to maintain the relationship. We're still behind him. We've got <coughs> some time to do the thing that will distinguish a really fine torpedo officer from a run of the mill. We're going to see whether our torpedo has enough range to actually connect. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the hypotenuse is scaled appropriately, and I always forget this process. Uh, multiply the speed of our torpedo by the number there, and divide by the maximum range of our torpedo, and if a less than relationship is satisfied, it'll have enough uh, endurance to reach the target. And we pull a lever, we press a, a, a trigger, and the torpedo's away. We'll cut ahead, a satisfying moment. <laughs> Geometry can be rewarding when you're at the firing side. <laughs> and uh, I guess it's worth saying, uh, many, many such works like this, no sooner have I finished Recently, I found that uh, by the time World War I was approaching, the Royal Navy uh, moved to other models of how to characterize the geometry. So the, the sights themselves changed, and it became more like the gunnery. It was based on deflection, and you became more sensitive to the range. In this, other than the check that your torpedo will have running distance enough to hit the target, the calculation of that angle is independent of the scale of the problem. The range is immaterial. Let's get a drink of water. You, you took that well. It's, it's quite a surprise. <laughs> I recognize it. <laughs> and this is going to be a long one. This will be 40 minutes. If I trip up, look away. <laughs> So from here, somebody on the internet saw my work. He knew about Dumerics and dryer firing tables and said you should try that. So I've moved on. Here we are on a 
replica of the Queen Mary. Our sailors now, you'll never see the sailors move, but they'll respond to the commands that I type as though I were saying them. And I've, I've tried to reproduce several of the mechanisms of communication, and this is something I'd certainly like to enhance my, my handling of. So we have a famous signal there, Jellicoe's signal. My model of interaction is, is that if somebody's doing a job, if I talk to them and, and give them orders, they'll understand them and act upon them, or I can come up and directly use uh, equipment which is idle, or I can tap someone on the shoulder and say, may I cut in, and in effect I take over their role. I feel it's important to allow people to navigate and experience the, the dimension and the beauty of these ships. Uh, and although I don't think a wireless shack was up here, it was convenient to get to. And this is something I actually made work in the simulation. You can, you can use your return key when you're sitting at this table, and if you tell another ship to turn north, after time you'll see that percolate through that ship's crew, and it will turn north. But we're receiving a message that an uh, enemy's been sighted off to starboard. And in this manner, I'd like to eventually include all the stations uh, of the ship and, and equip each with, with faithful reproduction tables. <laughs> with those officers and men with an employed and we can do these. But we're here to talk about gunnery. And so, uh, all fire control is really, of course, based upon observational data, uh, ranges and bearings being primary amongst them. And I'm going to step into the armored uh, rangefinder hood on Queen Mary, Queen Mary, and uh, going to look through the coincidence rangefinder. The, the Royal Navy was using Argo rangefinders and Barn Stroud equipment, all based on the coincidence principle. Uh, working little thumb knobs, I'm adjusting the geometry of prisms, which split my the top and bottom halves out around nine feet. And when they're aligned, I press a trigger. Continually, my motion on that thumb is, is sending impulses down uh, 25 yards per impulse to receivers in the transmitting station. And when I press the trigger, saying I think I've got a good range cut, uh, a, a shutter is flipped open to reveal that data so that it can be taken into calculation. Now here we are in uh, the transmitting station. Must be lunchtime. Uh, <laughs> nobody's really down here. But I've modeled a dryer table Mark III. Uh, the dryer table Mark III was the first of the dryer tables, but it's shown here largely as it would appear very late in the war. It's got some enhancements from its first, uh, as it was at Jutland, for instance. Three primary components. The range plot is, the, is perhaps the largest. It's a 36-inch wide expanse of paper which scrolls away from you two inches per minute. Uh, scales, uh, these brass scales, indicate the range precisely across the face. A special typewriter can be moved back and forth to imprint uh, the range cut data as they're signaled down from above. Uh, a grid with wires can be deflected so that the wires uh, and a scale will tell you how many yards per minute would that slope be indicating. In this way, an operator is taking a visual regression of the data. It'll be noisy, but he's taking the derivative to get us to the range rate, which will be vital. Uh, a pair of pencils trace the current range to the target, hypothesis, and uh, one that can be offset from it, uh, a red pencil, can be offset by a spotting correction in range, and that will trace our gun range at any given moment. Uh, they'll, they're influenced, they're riding on a worm screw, which is driven from a Vickers range clock, which we'll get to, and that can model any constant rate of change. Uh, of course, most engagements, the range between targets, if they're not maneuvering, will be a hyperbola, uh, but here we do a tangent to that hyperbola, and we're going to want to iterate that, so we approximate it. A Dumeric. Dumeric Mark VI in the Mark III dryer table. Uh, the Dumeric, of course, relates the relative motion of the target uh, and to a resultant range rate and a speed across, which, which that would do by projecting the, the relative motion onto a correctly oriented uh, Cartesian grid, which 
x range rate on one axis and speed across on the other. We have a range clock below with a pipper which when we slide along one projection, the range rate projection, uh, we can set the proper range rate by doing that. And a bearing clock helps us keep the enemy bearing properly set up. The third component, the bearing clock. Smaller piece of paper uh, which retreats upward. Uh, a single instrument on the ship, rather than the several range finders which are supported, a single bearing uh, indicating uh, scope up above or Dumer. Uh, when a trigger is pressed indicating that he's on for bearing, it comes down here, is rectified by the input of an Anschutz uh, gyroscope or a Sperry later, uh, and, and when he presses the trigger to indicate he's on and bearing, a, a point will go onto that paper. It's, it doesn't read 360 degrees across, it just does 10 degrees. We're more interested in the rate of change of bearing, the bearing rate, than the actual bearing at this point. Similar grid, we can, we can align the wires uh, to a given bearing rate and see if they seem to match the trends suggested in the points. Motion of the handle which deflects those wires also moves this index back and forth across the face of a pair of <coughs> deflection drums. These Think of these, if we unrolled the graphs which are on these to have a two-dimensional chart, the rotational axis is under the influence of the gun range counter. So gun range is one dimension, bearing rate is the other dimension. The functions that they describe, on the top one, it will, it will show the speed across that would result of the bearing rate you've got on here, and the gun range which is on the range plot, the lower one, a uh, similar shape to them is a knots of deflection for the sights, either at the director or at the guns for local control. This becomes the primary input into the deflection totalizer, which is a simple adding machine with four columns. Uh, the first one, we would take the reading on the lower drum and we would put it on, it's blurry here, but the dumeric deflection. There are also entries for wind, uncorrected drift, which we might need in local fire only. It's uh, and spotting corrections for deflection are input as well. The sum is a product, one of the major products of the transmitting station. But now I'm going to use the Doomerick. Uh, we are the, the Doomerick works off a vector principle, really. This overarching trapeze, which can be oriented with a dangling assembly, which can be slid backward, represents our motion vector. Actually, it represents the negative of our motion vector. To get a relative motion of the target, we want to subtract our motion vector from his motion vector. So we orient it to read our compass bearing, uh, and we slide the truck backward to our speed and knots on it. The dangling assembly then can be oriented either by judging an inclination of the enemy or a or a heading for the enemy, and a stem slid out on the same scale and knots to indicate his speed. The stem then reflects the sum of these two vectors, his motion minus our own, onto a Cartesian grid. We can orient that Cartesian grid uh, along the, the line of fire so that along that line we have range rate, if we've chosen the right scale for these pips. So here I could move, and the other is speed across. Uh, by, by its nature, one of the nice things, well, I'm going to start putting in a hypothesis here. I look at a gyro compass repeater, and I'm going to orient our heading to match it. You'll notice the little wobble uh, to the trapeze, which is our heading. And that's because, not shown, a flexible, a flexible screw would be driving uh, through the gyroscope, our heading is being continually maintained on that, and it's wandering. This is a pretty early gyroscope, uh, and it's got a shimmy back and forth, and it also has a low-frequency shimmy that's larger. Uh, that we, we look, can also look at a Forbes log occasionally and manually apply our own speed there, but when the captain's applying helm, uh, the, the, even the earliest dryer tables were substantially helm free. Uh, there was gearing also so that the enemy heading will be oriented properly under the influence of our turning. Because uh, it's riding on our bar, it required some clever 
uh, gearing to make that correct itself when the top bar moved. Uh, and let's see what I'm doing now. Enemy bearing. You'd like to think of this as reorienting that chart underneath. It didn't actually work that way. Of course, was the chart was always range rate across, speed across, up and down. You'd orient everything else to effectively uh, change the, the bearing. I just set the range clock. A little pepper slid out until it was equal. It was even with the projection along the line of bearing, and that should put the proper range rate on. There's a bearing clock, which is very similar, although much less important than the range clock. Uh, it will just, I can put in uh, up to 15 degrees right or left per minute that the bearing is changing, and uh, the enemy uh, bearing will be maintained. So it's, it's a crutch. It helps us. We still have to check that occasionally and rectify it. Here we're, here we're under helm, and, and we're moving along. You can see they're still wobbling, but it's maintaining and tracking our heading. The bearing clock's influence. Slow, but it, it's precessing. That's just a demonstration of the function. Uh, the range plot has, has its scales. Uh, it actually had two scales which it could be thrown into. You'll notice that the most significant digits are being seen through a window. That could be slid back and forth if we felt we were running out of paper. Uh, here's our grid. Uh, at any moment, the range, the, uh, the pencils are drawing on the paper slowly. We have no range rate on the clock, therefore the line is straight out. Uh, and I'll use the typewriter here. You look down, it supported up to nine different range finders, each had a key. And I, when a receiver overhead indicated a range cut had been taken, I would quickly slide along, uh, find the appropriate point on the scale, and hit the key corresponding to the range finder making this report. And we can see the effect of that. It's easy to imagine that uh, we, we put some letters. A dot was used for the main range finder. That was probably an echo of an earlier, simpler typewriter that they had during Jutland. Here's a, here's a Barn Stroud uh, Mark III single range receiver. And this is showing a range cut reported from above. These have shutters over theirs because they aren't making a report. When that person hit his trigger because he felt he had the range correct, it flips open to reveal a digital display on cyclometric uh, drums. Now, at the start of an action, uh, it would be necessary, well, we're, we're using the grid. The grid's wires can be deflected. Here we're showing 200 yards per minute opening, 400 yards per minute. When I let go of it, the wires snap back. They're spring-loaded, and they snap back to the, the slope that the range clock is currently generating. Uh, so in that way, you look through, and you'll always see the current hypothesis on the range uh, clock, but if you wanted to explore another hypothesis, you could, you could uh, do that, and the moment you let go, you'll be back where you were. Um, we, could, we, can retune our, we can retune our pencils if they, if they wandered from the, the range data that's being reported, because presumably we have the wrong setting on the range clock. Uh, we can just quickly jigger them into place. I've dialed on, on, the, on the Vickers range clock, I've dialed in an increasing range rate of 400 yards per minute. And we can see that now the pencils are being pulled along by that worm uh, screw that runs along the face of the clock. Here I am saying, well, if I were seeing range cuts being typed in here, I could explore. Well, what if we what if we closed the range rate 200 yards? The other pipper tells me that would then be 200 yards per minute opening. Just a few visual aids so people don't screw up with basic arithmetic. And this is a differential device, the spotting corrector. When, us, when corrections in range are piped down from above, uh, we, would, we would zero out this, uh, one of these pointers and we would dial in the amount indicated. Maybe he said, you know, up 200. And w by doing that, we are causing the two pencils, which were formerly at the same position, to, to be uh, a differential is going to be introduced of 200 yards. The red pencil is now 200 yards greater than, than the black pencil. 
The black pencil is really just a visualization cue. Uh, it might get retuned. Uh, its position doesn't mean all that much. Its slope is the more vital element in, within the transmitting station at this time. The red one, very important. That's what our guns are actually shooting at at the time. Uh, the last element, I'm, I'm just showing the black pencil could be could be moved once shooting had opened if, if we needed to get it back near the, the point cloud of, of observations. Here I'm going to demonstrate changing from the high range scale to the low. <coughs> Our pencil's getting driven off the left side of the paper. So I flick a little thumb knob, 24,000 becomes 16,000. Everything's lost 8,000 yards. The range tuner depresses a clutch and he works his handle to dial in 8,000 yards. Both pencils come along for the ride, but this clutch which he was using kept our actual gun range, which is going out to the guns, from being altered. It's, it's merely a change of reference for our visual display down here. It's not really a change in range. We just want more paper. That's how we do that. From the gun range counter, a flexible uh, shaft would, would bring the range over and move the red, the red pointer on the master range transmitter and somebody's job here would be to chase it with the black pointer and drive subordinate transmitters to send it to the director and each turret. Similarly, uh, deflection is going to have to get from the, uh, the bearing plot to the master bearing transmitter. But I'm, gonna, I'm working the lower handle, our wires are deflecting, our index is coming along for the ride, and I might look at, I might call out the Dumeric speed across, uh, and the Dumeric person might use that for a cross cut, uh, or to verify the setting that he has on the Dumeric. And I would take the value on the lower drum when I felt I had the right, uh, the right slope selected, and I would put that in the rightmost column of the totalizer. That is the speed across, or uh, sorry, that is the deflection owing to the, the change in bearing at the gun range we're at. So I guess I'm going to just demonstrate the function of how this works as an adding machine. The, the drift the, was uncorrected drift. Uh, the sights within the turrets were merely inclined. To account for drift, they just sort of leant over a little bit, and it provided a correction which was imperfect. D, uh, differences between the actually correct drift correction and of what we knew the sites were delivering, I believe, would be accounted for in that dial. But I'm moving, you know, some right Dumeric deflection, left wind. The, the red hand in the total column is being altered by the sum of those motions. My last step, more elbow grease, the big handle moves, chase it with the black pointer, and that's going to get it through a flexible uh, shaft over to the uh, master bear, I'm sorry, master deflection transmitter. I had approximately 30 knots right deflection, and I'll work this little handle, chase it down. Subordinate, uh, th this is just a mechanical device, not shown. A rate below it would be the actual transmitters, one for the director, and at least one for each of the turrets. Not sure if there might be any others. And we'll, we'll just bring things up. Our range clock has put our, this is why you want to have a lot of people down here. If you were running around moving all these knobs and switches, you'd have yesterday's gun solution. Uh, course command and uh, command uh, centralization and at point of command was uh, getting that all combined into one voice coming from the transmitting station was important. We'd have gun ready boards with fire pushes. Uh, there's a bell there which might ring if the captain presses his cease fire bell. And at the start of an action to, to get all the guns out to the approximate bearing, we have a pair of uh, bearing transmitters with local telltales. We could either, we could use a changeover switch to uh, command the forward and aft groups independently, or we could just tie them all together so that they were both told train uh, red 45. And we also are a receiving point for information from the, the gunnery officer, a bearing a receiver and a bearing rate receiver. The most important destination for the, for the ranges and the deflections that emanate from the transmitting station is the director. Uh, the cam type on a tripod mounting 
was the favored first incarnation of this in the Royal Navy, the first mature one. And this is how I thought it. As we opened it up, just as a little visualization aid, I, the, the hood vanishes, the like top. And we'll step inside and take the seat of the director layer. Therefore, command is solid. I have a sighting telescope, a pair of pistols, uh, uh, main and auxiliary to fire the guns, uh, send them firing at full standing selected. And on motion of my little handle to the right, I can elevate and depress uh, the telescope carrier. Uh, and I have a local repeat of this information. The black hands, degrees and minutes, are mechanical indications of, of the motion of the device. The red one is a step-by-step -step receiver. It has some granularity. It's supposed to track my use of that handle. Uh, the phone man is, handles communications, and he also has the gun ready board. He can select or deselect on a mount-by-mount -mount basis what will be influenced by the use of his trigger. Uh, training is a little bit tricky. He has two handles to train. He has sort of a fine and a coarse mode, the coarse mode being slewing mode. The reason was it is uh, the step-by-step -step transmitters that they use could really only be expected to reliably convey steps at a thousand steps per minute. Uh, this would the the fine mode would send in four minute steps, and if you do the math, that comes out to a, a training rate that tops out at a degree a second, which would seem like an eternity if a new enemy popped up off the beam. Uh, so he, they could switch it. They could use a larger handle, go in two degree steps, maybe up to thirty degrees per minute, and and the. Uh, they have a fine and of course hand that they match on the repeat device. Um, in the sight setter, he has he has uh, cam work sights, but we see that the red pointers, which indicate what the transmitting station is sending him, are just pegged at the bottom of their range. This might be a common condition when we first sat down, and the issue is, is that we have to synchronize the devices. They're not synchronous by their nature. And I'll do this, I'll tell these men, line up the sights. The method of doing this was pretty simple. They drive their transmitters to, to their low extreme, and then they would cycle it to the high extreme, and then come back to the actual point that they want to convey. This is much like squaring a, a deck of cards on a table. The ones which are too far left are brought far enough right, the ones too far right come left. And once we're back there, uh, we should have everyone uh, reading the same value. This might be a recovery operation, or if you switch directors in battle, you might have to line up the sights again, you might have to line up on the director. Uh, and just demonstrating the sight setting motion. If I dial range on, we're depressing the intermediate arm of the director, bringing down the uh, telescopes, and if similar with deflection, going left or right, we get an opposite motion of the appropriate uh, magnitude. Uh, the main frame is, is, is being yaw. Uh, of course, with the combined influence of the motion of the trainer and the, the layer to keep their crosshairs on target, this should keep the <coughs> appropriate angles set to the guns. It's a little bit of a mess here in the turret, but maybe you've seen that. Uh, it's somewhat coarsely depicted. Um, we, have a, we have a trainer, uh, a layer for each gun, and we'll, we'll start by looking at the trainer. In director fire, he had he really didn't have much to do. He no longer really trained the gun. He was a range safety officer, in fact. If a friendly ship got in the way, he'd throw a switch to interrupt the firing circuit. The real work was done the level below by the turret director trainer, and he has he has a follow the point pointer receiver. Uh, it has two pairs of hands. Uh, to receive the course and the fine signals from above, two degree steps for course, four minute steps for fine. It also has a lower handle. He'll keep an ear cocked for the sight setter to occasionally call out the range. And he will dial in the gun range on a convergence device whose mechanical beauty is stunning. I, I have to focus on what it does rather than how it does it, but I, I wish I knew. Um, and it, it would, it, rather than have all our shells comb the sky in a parallel fashion downrange, they would lean in toward a point of convergence at the gun range we are currently using. 
there was a maximum of 1.5 degrees uh, convergence that could be attained by that. So it would be a quirk that if somebody came in pretty close, you'd start to see the turrets further from our director you know, stop achieving full convergence. Uh, and it's curious, the, the influence of setting the range on the convergence device actually jiggers our black handle, our black pointer, rather than the red one. But the, the net result is that bringing the pointers into alignment will achieve uh, the best convergence that we can manage. We'll go over and see the follow the pointer job being performed by a gun player. Is the scope, which he might use for his own notification, uh, but he'll be following the pointer. Uh, pistols he won't be using in the fire, of course. This is a beautiful device. Uh, the elevation receiver uh, does several functions. It has a pair of hands, although it's only getting one data feed from the director. They've just blown it up so we get minutes around the big hand so it can line up more precisely. But it does several other things. It has to correct for the dip, the change in height between this gun and the director. And that's done by aligning an index with the gun range currently in use. So he's also keeping an air cocked for the sight setter to call out ranges. But on top is the real magic bit is a tilt corrector. There's a similar one in the director. But by, in the dockyard, calculating the angle of training at which the maximum elevation error is caused by the imperfect mounting of this turret on its roller tracks, we, we, spin, we orient the inside dial till that's indicated, that training is indicated, and we, we slide this inner spindle along a track until the number of minutes, up to 12 minutes of tilt, and we lock that all down. It receives input from the slewing circuit, of, or you might think of that as the training angle of the turret, and it revolves on a one-to-one -one basis. If you picture the drive arm on a locomotive, it comes back and forth. The net effect is that when he keeps the proper sight lined up with the index, we're correcting for tilt imperfection, the dip, there's a quiver of ten such strips, each ten feet per second slower and slower as the gun degrades, it's correcting for muzzle velocity deterioration. The last bit that's magic, you notice convergence in range I haven't mentioned. Somebody came up with a clever manner of doing a polar plotting analysis that they could fudge the angle of training and the magnitude of the tilt imperfection, and they could make it converge at a given range. They harmonize at a range. Anything else would be approximate. But that's hats off person that comes up with that. Uh, and I guess I, there's a lower handle to, to align the index, and it causes the entire lower assembly, except the black hand, uh, to be reoriented. And because it's taking the red hand along with it, that's what's creating the difference, which will be correcting for dip, tilt, and muzzle velocity. Brilliant. A little bit, little bit tougher to use than just keeping the pointers aligned, but given the number of things it's doing for you, it's a miracle. So now, now it's time to hear the guns roar. I apologize for any flashbacks this may cause. It's not too, it's not too dramatic. I, I spot, I'm the gunnery officer and I'm typing this out. When I, when I say it uh, in orange, I set it into a phone which I'm carrying. I cheat, I have a phone. Now, now it's gone through the transmitting station, and people are, are starting to train the target, and start to get range and bearing data. I think I have the bearing rate, uh, the training rates of the turrets uh, somewhat accurate. There's the Q turret. And a little hard to see. We've got a spotting officer and a range officer in the spotting top. Uh, the director is, is lined up on the target. And presumably he slewed over there and then dropped out of slewing mode so he could get the final line. And now we should have some data starting to arrive from the, I've modeled two rangefinders, not every rangefinder on the ship. Uh, but we hear things getting tight through the action of the solenoids punching into there and the range plot person uh, looking up, grabbing range cuts and typing them onto the paper. So let's see. Uh, waiting, waiting. 
here some, the main range finder just reported 14,800 and some, and he's right on the job. Boy, can't even get there to look at him, and it's already put on the paper. <laughs> They, they, they've got an increasing range rate that they've synthesized for themselves. One thing that's lacking, I have no information on, help me here guys, is uh, I don't have a dryer calculator. And later I'll, I'll just fudge, I'll give them a, because we have a, a range rate, we probably want to do an initial spotting correction to account for the change in range during the time of flight. I'd love to know more about the dryer calculator, which would probably be hanging on the wall. Here, here I'm looking, we don't have much of a bearing rate, but I look down, I'm, I've stepped in so I'm doing the job myself, and it looks like we've got two to the left. And, and so I'm going to say, I'll type out Dumeric deflection for length. And that would call, he's, he's, he's dragging the pepper uh, to a speed across that echoes that. He set his range clock appropriately, it, it's matching the projection along the line of fire. Um, the, one of the parts I like about this is that you actually, the, this, you can see that I'm here and I can hear uh, the men talking. Uh, the transmitting station is using a Navy phone to talk to the spotting top. Uh, I use the concept that if something's important to you and the job you're currently doing, it comes up in bold. And that's your key to do something. Uh, and so I, I call in, I call in a, we now have a negative bearing rate, I said down 200 or something, and he, he's, he's put in that guess at uh, an initial spotting correction in range. And we'll go up to the spotting top. I have a spotting officer and a range officer. The range officer is supposed to reserve unto himself the final call on what rate is set on the clock. Uh, down at the transmit station. They will, when they think a new one is warranted by uh, the data they're seeing on the range plot, they'll call it up to him and he'll okay it or, or issue his own. I, I've typed out a, a enemy's course 90 to the left to 20 knots. Uh, the tumor at uh, I said open fire. He's starting to get really excited now. <laughs> Hits. 
So uh, this is where I'm and just here to show in action the sight setter watching his red pointers move under the range clock and the spotting correction influence. And he, he just works his, his range setting handle and reflection setting knob to keep them aligned with the index. Uh, and there's a sighting correction, so a rapid, a rapid bump in the indicated range. And that would be the sort of thing that I'd want to verbally tell the layer uh, not to get frightened by. Uh, now, we're, now we're in uh, Jerry land. Uh, we're seeing what it's like to be on the receiving end of this. Not, we won't hang out here. Don't get upset. <laughs> and, and, and for now, we'll, we'll call an end to this madness. But we'll we'll tell our we'll send our grandchildren an email about it. <clears throat> and so we're we're in the, the conning tower. I wish I had different sailors and different rank uniforms. These probably aren't even authentic Royal Navy uh, uniforms. But we'll we'll ring the captain's ceasefire bell. And uh, I guess I could pause here. I have an additional video which shows a graphical analysis, which Stuart looked at and he said, that's going to confuse everyone. Uh, but this would, be a, this would be a good opportunity to do a few questions and answers, and then we can determine whether you want to see a little bit of a graphic mess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have tricks like ladders and zigzags, which didn't seem to get mentioned in your... Well, the, the rules and, and procedures change. I only started to address some of the rules and procedures which the Royal Navy used, and uh, I, certainly we didn't see any there. Um, I, I only just yesterday got a, a photographic copy of the 1916 spotting rules, with, which to some extent tried to combine range rate corrections and range uh, spotting corrections into a single choice. Uh, the, and the pattern was, this might have been only practicable after hitting had recently been accomplished, but any given range correction you call down would, would be bolted onto a half rate correction. So if you set up 400, you'd say open 200. Open the, you're not saying the, range rate to use, but you're expressing a delta off the current range rate which you'd like to see applied. Apart from that, there, there's probably, this has probably been an area with great evolutionary history. I've only begun to look at it. And that, that, that is, I think, came in when we found the Germans using the adjustments to the Yeah. Well, I, I do, uh, I did endow my virtual spotting officer with a sense that if you just open fire and you determine you, you bring it on for deflection first, and then if you're short, you bring it up 800. If you're long, you bring it down 800. When you, once you cross the target, you're doing a binary search, as us computer geeks would call it at that point. You're, you'd have the amount of your correction, and it's like playing guess the number. Um, so by the time we came along, you much later. And you see, it was short, so I must have gone blind. Yeah. People go up the ladder, and the ladder was 400 yards between the uh, three buttons of the ladder. How many guns would you fire in each uh, in each uh, rung? Well, I think one turret to get to the uh, to the got the range. And then, when, having got your bracket uh -huh. uh, between the, the lines of the ladder, you then did your zigzag, uh, which was 200. Okay. Yeah, between the ladders, between the ranks, and then you, 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 you did your broadside fire. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I can manually, if I'm the person doing the spotting job, I, I can choose to do any, any such <laughs> tack. But I, I find it's incredibly tedious to make these sailors flexible in their thinking. <laughs> when something goes wrong, finding out who is doing something stupid is next to impossible. Uh, but that's one of my primary interests in taking this further, is to make it that more than one person can play it at a time, uh, so that you can have smart people, uh, informed people doing these things. 
uh, and you'll have, I, I feel, a better chance to reflect the flexibility. Uh, the dryer table, one of the interesting things about it to me when I look at it, isn't that you put, you put the, the raw beef in one end, you turn the handle and you get sausage out the other. There's, um, there are many different ways in which you can choose to have it influence itself just internally or how you provide feedback to it in the form of spotting. So the, the mode of use is in many ways as important as the device itself. And uh, that's something that's not often heard of when we think of a computational process these days. It's, I think the way I, I choose to describe it is it's as much a workbench for solving fire control problems as it is a computer to solve them for you. Um, you, you might, particularly in the Mark III table, the later tables had an electric Dumeric, which was better integrated to the table. Um, here you might have a given, it's, it's just happenstance that you might set your range clock so that it coincides with the enemy pipper on the Dumeric. Uh, I think you get some flexibility by being able to tinker with that Dumeric and, and and do a cross cut without necessarily changing your range clock, which is of course going to have an immediate effect through at the most important uh, phases of the process. The guns are going to be changing where they shoot at, and you're just trying to perhaps fantasize that a better uh, enemy speed and heading might better explain what you're seeing. Uh, but uh, there's always there's always something more to do. But I'd like my first outlet is I'd like to spend less time writing computer programs that try to mimic the sometimes simple and the sometimes subtle choices these these people had to make. Everything gets difficult when you're telling a computer to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. You uh, last understood something I read about Jackson. It's just one of the orders. The swarm officer said, "Down." 200, do not apply, change range rate. And so they would adjust the clock from the, uh, from the director. That, that's, it's, it's difficult to find. You can sometimes get the most uh, intricate detail on how a knob was burled, uh, but you, you don't always get a sense of uh, where's the, the gunnery officer and, and what what responsibilities is he personally shouldering versus which one is he perhaps delegating to someone else? Uh, the process, the human process, is, is under-documented. Well, in this particular case, he was actually going to be discussing it with the spotting officer and then deciding between them what to do. So, uh, well, uh, one thing that I, I guess I know is that there were many more doom wrecks and in exposed positions where where there you're thinking more about target inclination than anything else. Uh, that's the nominal purpose why the range officer had the, had the final authority on the setting of the range clock is that he can see the target, the men below cannot and might be uh, laboring under some chart-fed fantasy. Uh, but I, I've noticed just in doing it, it's the classic case is when you're nearly beam on to the enemy, inclinations near 90 either way, it's very difficult. To, he has to really come nose or bow or stern on to you before you start to get a sense that there's any deviation from wrong side on and, and is it opening, is it toward or away? Uh, it, unless you have a doomer too, it's easy to get fooled. The, the fact that he seems to be coming toward you a little bit doesn't mean that he's closing with you. Uh, and I think having doomerics above where there, you'd set the bearing by a rifle sight, uh, looking straight at him. Uh, but there, you could then look at your enemy bar and say, well, yeah, that seems right. And um, I, I'd like to be able to do those sorts of things as well. One of the things I found most interesting was seeing the ancestor of the Admiralty Fire Control Table of our childhood. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely fascinating. And one's admiration for the people who invented uh, it is phenomenal after what you say. Well, I, I, I certainly agree. I, I think the, the sense of uh, awe doubles when you consider the rapidity with which this yes. was 
uh, the need for it didn't exist 20 years previously, maybe even uh, 10 years. The relationship well, of, 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 of the, the, the kit you've been talking about with the director is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. The concept of the director must have allowed the sort of sophistication you've been talking about, did not Well, uh, the director, I guess the, the boilerplate wisdom that underlies it, its its development was to was to facilitate to ensure that everyone's shooting at the same target. Uh, they had they had very meager means to communicate uh, a precise training, and so if your enemy is in line and they're at an extended range, you might have half your guns pointing at one ship, another half pointing at the one immediately behind it in line, and all using the same range information, which will seldom satisfy both sets of uh, layers. Um, but you, you, you elevated the eyes further. The, the light aloft director, which I modeled, it's the only one I have on that ship. Uh, the late, by the end of World War I, most ships had a light aloft tower, an armored ring, uh, director tower, and they'd have one or maybe even two directing guns that a, one gun within one turret might act, might act as the pointing device and, and share the data with the others. But the first choice was the light aloft tower. It was probably the most vulnerable uh, to damage, uh, but it, it had the best perch to see from, and maybe with its thin walls, you had a chance to hear somebody yelling at you, you bonehead, you're doing something wrong with the spotting top right behind it. Uh, the, range, the armored tower was the next line of uh, retreat if that became a casualty, and then they could have directing guns. Were all those transmitters electric, or I think it was called Baudenoir? Uh, what was the term you used? Uh, what Baudenoir, you used to have a wire inside of an armored cable. Yeah. Well, they, they were electrical. Uh, they, they were done on a step-by-step -step principle, as the Royal Navy termed it, and, and that essentially meant that, that the receivers were... M. Okay. Uh, the, I, the, the, uh, the servo motors in the receivers would sit there, much as a modern day robot moves its arms through servo motors, you would, you would just quantize the information that you're thinking, think, what's the granularity we need, what rate, uh, I mean you have a trade off there. Like one reason why, even though hydraulics developed tremendously by the end of the war, continuous aim was not really a feasible, uh, feasible choice for the Royal Navy in World War I in director fire with the big guns because the, the rate at which the elevation could be transmitted from the director to the guns was quantized as 1.5 minutes per step. The, the transmitter and receiver might, might get out of alignment if you exceeded a thousand steps per minute. And if you do the math, that works out to a maximum change, instantaneous change of elevation of under a half a degree a second. And so, um, you know, if in a heavy sea, which might be where you wanted to achieve the greatest benefit from continuous aim, uh, it really was just beyond your capabilities, not necessarily from a hydraulic standpoint, but from a data throughput standpoint. And that's, uh, I mean, in many ways, I look at these ships and it, it, many of the same issues that come with configuring a computer network uh, these days. It, it, or it, it looks also, to my eye, an awful lot like uh, uh, launch control for NASA in the 60s. It's a problem of tremendous uh, novelty and that exceeds the capacity for any individual and any single machine to solve. So they factor it down and they employ a corporate approach, which uh, has to only double the complexity of its development. Um, perhaps it's because I was late, but I didn't hear anything about a rate officer, a, a bloke who took the inclination. Um, so that could be seen probably long before it could be appreciated in the change of range. Well, well that, um, my, my reading might be incomplete or I'm missing something. And I sometimes call him the raid officer, but I, I believe what I'm actually reading is that that's the range officer. And it might not be an officer. Well, but actually that one, the spotting officer, they always use that term, but they're also yeah, quick to uh, That might be any, any seaman who just demonstrated the craft. 
uh, more than others. But I, I use that person in the body as I've been naming him, the range officer, to uh, receive suggestions for the range rate by Navy phone from the transmitting station and to uh, reply with an alteration or rubber stamp. But was there any attempt to allow for ship motion, pitch and roll, effects firing on the uh, beaker roll or whatever? Um, well, you could, you could you could do s several approaches. Again, they, they were essentially firing on the roll because continuous aim w was problematic for them. Uh, but even in choosing to fire on the roll, you get your choice as to at what point in the roll do you want to press the triggers. Um, there was a latency that might have been, unless I'm misremembering it, as much as four tenths of a second from the pressure of the triggers and the discharge of the guns. And that became, uh, that became, there was no solution for that. That was, uh, that was a talent that the, that the, lay, the director layer was to develop, which is, I have to guess, I have to pull my trigger at the point where my wires are, that it, 0.4 seconds in the future, they'll be at where I truly want to see the, <laughs> the, the, the shells leave. But there's nothing laid down in the manual at that time. Uh, I'm, I'm shocked, I have some fundamental questions of my own as to the, the shape of the cams and the, and the settable sites for range. And the, the point of issue I have is the, I used to call it the look down angle, but I believe it's the angle of observation. And, uh, but one thing that particularly puzzles me is I read that they might say, okay, our point of aim is the water line, or the horizon, or it's, it's the top deck, and, and the, it's the foremast. And I just don't understand why somebody would, would make that sort of like a dealer's choice when, when there are so many uh, decisions manifested in the design of the equipment that are supplying you range and deflection. Uh, to me that seems un unpardonably sloppy, but uh, maybe visibility uh, it's, 